Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fulbright Canada U.S. Scholar Information Session organized by the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies and sponsored by Duke University's Office of Global Affairs and Fulbright Canada. Today's presentation will open with remarks from our speaker, followed by a Q&A session to allow for questions from the audience. Now I'll turn things over to Amanda Frederick, Assistant Director of the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Rohini. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce Paolo Carvalho and welcome him virtually to Duke University. Paolo Carvalho is the Program Officer for Outreach and Recruitment at Fulbright Canada, where he is responsible for the planning, implementation, and management of the foundation's recruitment strategy for both the Student Scholar Awards and is the primary point of contact for grantees, alumni, and partners on matters relating to recruitment. Thank you again, Paolo, for your willingness to speak with us today about these wonderful opportunities afforded through Fulbright Canada, and thanks to everyone for joining us. And now, please let us welcome Paolo Carvalho. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you to everyone at Duke that was involved in the promotion and setting the, the presentation for today. So in the next uh, 30 to 35 minutes, I will be talking about the opportunities that Fulbright Canada offers to U.S. scholars. So during the presentation, I will not be able to answer any questions, but I will address questions uh, shortly after the presentation finishes. Um, you will notice that the presentation has a mix of information on the awards and on the application, uh, which is uh, what most people usually uh, are interested in knowing from the get-go in terms of the awards. So I will just um, disconnect the video during the presentation and I will come back to it uh, during the Q&A session. So for the first, um, first thing that I would like to address is the different types of awards that we have at Fulbright Canada. One of the good things about Fulbright Canada is that it's the Fulbright Commission that hosts the most, the, the highest number of awards for US scholars. And our awards are um, separated into different categories. So we have the traditional all-discipline award. We have a category for postdoctoral awards. We have the distinguished chair program, and we also have the research chair program. As you can see, each program has a set uh, financial support associated, as well as a specific uh, number of awards that are included in each category. We will discuss the awards during the presentation, so I will not be spending a lot of time here. Just to say that each award has a, um, a fixed amount that it's allocated to the successful candidate. So the way that Fulbright Canada works in terms of funding is we will allocate to each award a fixed amount and the successful applicant is entitled to the full amount should they be selected. One of the things about applying to Canada is that you may think that it should be a pretty similar uh, place in, in comparison to the US. However, one of the great things about Canada and the cities where our awards are located is that they are very multicultural. Canada being primarily a country of immigration welcomes people from all over the world. And that is reflected in the not only in the university staff, but also in the in the vibe of each Canadian city. Also, one of the things that uh, you will encounter in, in Canada is the opportunity to develop eventually certain um, activities that you are not that you may not be doing in the US. Everyone uh, obviously knows about Canadian winters and you will definitely experience the Canadian winter should you be uh, coming for a Fulbright in January, but that usually is something that people truly appreciate and embrace as a way of doing different things that they may not be used to doing well in the US. One of the things that is important to know about the, the Fulbright Awards is that they are located in cities which for the most part are not the highest cost cities in Canada. Um, our awards, as you will see, are spread out across the country, and in most of the cities, 
the cost of, of living is relatively affordable, mainly because as a scholar, you would come on a, an exchange of either four months or eight to nine months. So uh, one, one other thing that it's, that it's good to, to know is that all of our awards are paid in US dollars. So when you convert it to Canadian dollars, there's always some advantage there due to the currency exchange. So let's now look at the location of the different shares so that you can have an idea of where they are, where you can find them. So just as a brief introduction, most of our research shares are located in the different provinces of Canada that sit um, just over the territory of the US, unless you consider Alaska, obviously. So we have awards in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia. Let's now look at the different institutions that offer awards at each province. So the institutions that I will be listing here are institutions that are associated with the category of awards that are under the research chairs or the distinguished research chairs. Also, the postdoc awards are hosted at the universities that are listed here, and we will go into more detail um, in the next slides. So looking at Ontario, which is the province that hosts the most awards, we have Brock University, University of Guelph, McMaster University, Queen's University, York, Carleton, and Ottawa. So for those that are not entirely familiar, New York is located in Toronto and Carleton and Ottawa are located in the city of Ottawa. We have Western, Lakehead and the University of Windsor, which are also located in Ontario. So Ontario is by far the province that hosts the most number of awards. And finally, we also have Trent, Waterloo and the Balsili School of International Affairs that closed the group of universities in Ontario. In Quebec, so the French speaking province in uh, Canada, we have awards being hosted at Université Laval, which is located in Quebec City, and the foundation Pierre Elliott Trudeau that is located in Montreal. In the provinces of British Columbia, we have Vancouver Island University and the University of Northern British Columbia. In the province of Manitoba, we have the University of Manitoba and in the province of Nova Scotia, just beside the Atlantic, it's St. Mary's University. In the middle of the country, in the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan, we have the University of Regina, which is located in the province of Saskatchewan and the University of Alberta and Calgary, which are located in the province of Alberta. So now that we have an idea of which are the universities and in which provinces they are located, let's look into more detail in regards to the research chairs. As you can see by the list that it's mentioned here, we host uh, research chair awards in different fields. Some fields have more awards than others. However, the good thing is that in total, we offer uh, close to 50 different awards under this category of the research chairs. In addition to the research chairs, we will also be addressing the distinguished research chairs that are hosted solely at Carleton University and also postdoctoral opportunities. So let's start with awards in arts, humanities, and culture. As you can see here, these awards Oops, sorry. These awards are um, hosted at different institutions. We have at the top the distinguished chair that is hosted for a full academic year at Carleton University in arts and social sciences in Canada and North America. So I will not be reading everything about this slide. So what I just want to make sure is that um, it's clear what this information entails. So. In each category, you will see the name of the award, the university hosting the award, the duration of the award, if it's four or nine months, and the financial um, amount for the grant for each award. So a distinguished chair will entitle the person to 50,000 US dollars, while the research chair for four months is half of that, 25,000. 
So under the research share categories, we have awards being hosted at the University of Alberta in Arts and Humanities, also in the same university in Society and Culture. University of Guelph is hosting an award in Digital Humanities and the University of Calgary, one in Transnational Histories of North America. Also, the same university is interested in receiving US scholars that are doing work in values and science. You will also see that in each of these slides, there's a brief specialization description. So the, 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 the aim of this description is to make sure that whoever is interested in applying can get some idea on which are the fields that the university is interested in exploring. However, this list is not does not entail every single field. So if there is a particular award that you're interested, but you are unsure if the award is suitable for what you want to do, you can always reach out to us and we can contact the host university to see if your field of interest is something that they would consider um, as, as, as a, an area of interest. In the field of business and management, we have two different research chairs, the distinguished research chairs at Carleton University, one in entrepreneurship and another in social innovation. And we have also two research chairs, one at Queen's University in business and management and another in business out of the University of Alberta. In the field of education, we have awards being hosted at the University of Alberta, in the general field of education. The University of Calgary is interested in scholars developing work in digital technologies and sustainability. Western University is interested in topics regarding Catholic social teaching. And the University of Ottawa is looking for scholars interested in indigenous education. One of the things that you will also see during this description is that there are awards that intersect different sections. So for example, this award in indigenous education, you will see it here as we talk about education, but you will also see the same award in the indigenous studies category. One important thing is that each of these opportunities corresponds to one award. So there is only one spot for each of these opportunities. In environmental studies, there's um, quite a few uh, selection of awards that are available. So under the Distinguished Research Chair at Carleton University, we have an award in the general category of environmental sciences. And then under the research chairs, there are different awards for four months. So Lakehead University has an award in interdisciplinary sustainability solutions. University Laval has an award in advancing transdisciplinary research on changing north. The University of Ottawa has an award in environmental policy, another award in environment and economy, and the University of Alberta, an award in agricultural life and environmental sciences. One thing that you will also notice is that some awards are pretty broad. So for example, awards in uh, envi environment, environmental sciences, for example. So that, that, that opens basically the scope to projects in very different fields, while others are much more specific. So for example, environment and economy. And this is something that you will notice across our different awards. Some, some host universities like to leave the awards more open so that they are able to receive projects in very different fields and then basically select the ones, the one that seem to be most relevant to them at the time, while others are much more specific. We also have a category regarding food studies where we are uh, once again, with the, the award the Agricultural Life and Environmental Science from the University of Alberta. So it's exactly the same award as you find in the environmental studies. And we have an award for food security that is hosted at the University of Guelph. Health studies offer awards from McMaster University in Mental Health and Societal Wellbeing, the University of Alberta in Health in Northern or Indigenous Communities, the University of Calgary in Child and Youth Mental Health, the University of Guelph in One Health, and the University of Ottawa in Health, Law, Policy, and Ethics. So all of these awards are four months and they offer 25,000 US dollars. 
the competition that is currently open uh, and it, it will be open until September 15 for, for applications, is for awards starting in September 2023 or January 2024. So just for, for your information, Fulbright awards and applications always run one year before the start date. So all of these opportunities that we are talking here are for the, the, the soonest will be September 2023. Indigenous studies is an area for which Fulbright Canada has made a big effort in advancing awards and the number of awards. So we have awards that are being hosted at the McMaster University in Indigenous Resilience. The University of Alberta hosts two different awards, Indigenous Law and Legal Issues and Native Peoples and Communities. The University of Guelph has an award in Indigenous Public Policy and Criminal Justice. Vancouver Island University has an award in Aboriginal Studies and the University of Ottawa, the award in Indigenous Education that we also talked about in the education category. North America Studies is a category that um, is very relevant for Fulbright Canada because one of the things that we need to make sure that happens during a Fulbright is that topics that are being addressed are of interest both to Canada and to the US. So this is obviously a category that makes total, total sense for, for us here in Canada. So there are five awards in this category. The award of hosted at Brock University in Transnational Studies, Carleton University hosts two awards in Canada-US relations and North American politics. Trent University also has an award in comparative Canada-US studies and the University of Waterloo an award in anti-racism and BIPOC communities. Policy law and governance is also a big field for, for us in terms of number of awards. So there are uh, several research chair awards, but let's start with the Distinguished Research Chair at Carleton University in Public Affairs in North America. So as you noticed, all the Distinguished Research Chairs are for a full academic year. Under the Research Chair categories, we have the Balsili School of International Affairs hosting an award in Global Governance, McMaster University in Digitalization and Democracy, Université Laval in International Studies, University of Ottawa hosts four awards in this category, so in governance and public administration, human rights and social justice, science and society, and health, law, policy and ethics. The category of science and technology hosts two awards, one at the University of Manitoba in different fields, science, technology, engineering or math, so they are basically interested in receiving proposals for projects under any of these categories, and the University of Ottawa in Science and Society. Finally, there's a category of awards under the research chair that it's called the All-Discipline. So the All-Discipline basically means that the universities that host these awards are not interested in a particular field. Instead, they would like to receive projects in a variety of fields that aligned with their priorities. So, all of these awards have the general name of all disciplines. However, when reading about them in the specialization, you notice that in some cases they may tend more towards a specific field of knowledge, which they would have a preference, um, because sometimes these awards might be, for example, hosted at a particular department, so that department, although comprising different subjects, would not be available, uh, available, for example, if it's a arts and humanities department, obviously they will not be available to um, welcome someone from the engineering field and so on. So it's it's very important to read the specialization just to get a sense of which are the, the fields that um, the, the universities would like to host awards. So we have awards at St. Mary's University, so the University of Nova Scotia, York University, it's located in Toronto, and the University of Regina, located in the city with the same name in Saskatchewan. Finally, we have postdoctoral awards. So although these awards may not be a, 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 an exact fit for the ones that are listening to the presentation, 
This might be interesting if you are, for example, supervising students um, or you get to know students that are doing a PhD and would like to go into a postdoc afterwards. The postdocs that are available are in uh, Northern Issues at the University of Northern British Columbia. So it's a full year, 30,000 US dollar award. There is also an award that it's being hosted at any institution in Canada that might be developing work in Indigenous studies. So this is an internal award from Fulbright office, 60,000 US dollars for 12 months, plus a 30,000 um, additional eventual for travel and research. And also there's a Fulbright um, postdoctoral award in Black History that's being hosted at the University of Windsor Department of History, once again for a full academic year, and offers 50,000 US dollars. One of the things that I would like to um, just highlight is the fact that we have a research chair award that it's being hosted at the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation that is in the topic of global economies. This award is, although it's a research, it's a research chair because it implies a residency in Canada for four months, it's an award that it's a bit different from all the other research chairs because it will also imply, in addition to those four months, a one-year uh, collaboration with the, the foundation. So that this collaboration is done remotely or, or can be done remotely. And so therefore, there is no need for the person to remain in Canada after the four months of the residential exchange. That's the, that is the only difference, is the fact that in addition to the residency, there is also the one-year remote work and then there are some activities that the foundation would like to engage the, the successful scholar um, that are basically um, ways to network and develop uh, uh, your, your, your expertise and contact with other Canadians throughout that one year via a series of different events. Just wrapping up, and because this information was included in the slides, but it was, it, it, it may be sometimes confusing what is the difference between distinguished chairs and the research chair. So the distinguished chairs are awards that are only being hosted at Carleton University in Ottawa. They are all for nine months and they will offer 50,000 US dollars for the duration of the, of the, of the visiting research. The awards for this year are in the topics that you see here in the blue rectangles, arts and social sciences in Canada and North America, entrepreneurship, environmental sciences, public affairs in North America, society policy and media and social innovation. Now, moving on to the eligibility and the actual application. One of the things that it's essential to apply for Fulbright Awards when you are applying for the US scholar competition is that everyone needs to have US citizenship. You can also have dual citizenship US can Canadian, that's perfectly fine, or any other uh, citizenship, as long as you have the US. Recipients of a Fulbright uh, award in the past are able to reapply two years after the date of their previous grant was completed. So once you have completed your grant, you wait two years and then you can reapply. Our um, grants will not um, be eligible for anyone that has interested in doing research that involves clinical trials. So that's something that it's very important to, to highlight. If there is research that involves contact with patients, um, or contact with uh, or, or research that involves animals, that is not something that uh, you will likely be able to get through a Fulbright. One other thing that it's important to notice is that you must have not lived outside of the USA for five consecutive years in the last six. Okay, so sometimes there are scholars that might have might have worked abroad for several years and are now returning. If that is the case, and if you spend more than five consecutive years abroad, then you will need to wait before you can apply. And everyone needs to apply by September 15, 2022. 
So some of the things that you need to pay attention. When applying for our awards, you do not need an invitation letter for any of the research chairs, the distinguished um, chairs, or the postdoc. However, you will need an invitation letter if you are applying for the research for the traditional Fulbright Award. This is an award that is hosted every year. There are two or three awards available every year, and they can allow the US scholar to go to or, or to come to any institution in Canada that does research that is relevant to your field. However, this is an award that will it, it, usually it's the most competitive award because of its open nature. You can go to any institution in, in Canada. And also is the one that will not provide you as much financial support. So instead of the typical 25,000 for four months, this will give you half of that, 12,500. <clears throat> so our recommendation is if there is a research chair that is of interest to you, always apply for the research chair instead of the traditional Fulbright award because your chances of receiving the award are higher and also the financial benefit is better. If you are applying for the research chair, the all disciplines, so one of the last slides that we saw, a, uh, a letter of invitation is not mandatory. However, if you're able to get one, that might help your application. However, only for that category, the all discipline research chairs. Finally, one other thing just to keep in mind is that retired professionals can apply for Fulbright awards. So even if you're not an active scholar, you can still apply for a research chair, either because you're retired or because you're an independent researcher. Uh, there is no need to have an affiliation at the time of application. Now, the elements of the application. The project statement needs to be five pages. So the, the way that the application, and we, we will look at the application platform in just, uh, in just a while. However, these are the, the main components of type of documentation that you need to provide. So a project statement of up to five pages, a CV of up to six pages if you're applying for the research chair or eight if you're applying for the distinguished research chair. You need two, uh, to recommend it, to, to references, to colleagues that will give you recommendations. Bibliography is up to three pages. A syllabus is only required if you're applying for the uh, 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 an opportunity that involves teaching. Most of our opportunities do not involve teaching, they involve research. So for the vast majority of our awards, there's no need to uh, submit a, a, a syllabus in with your application. If you're unsure if the award requires um, or involves formal teaching, if you, if you go to our website and you read the description of the award, it will say if it involves formal teaching or not. But like I said, the vast majority of them do not involve. The letter of invitation, we just talked about it in the in the previous slide. So only for the traditional all discipline award is it is it um, is it recommended. And for the traditional Fulbright, that's mandatory. The language proficiency is English, so most people will not have an issue with this. So in the project statement, what are some of the things that you need to be um, writing about? So these are just some ideas to assist people to start writing about the project statement. Um, there are samples of project statements that you can have access through the link and the, 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 that it's mentioned below. Uh, however, most of the things that you need to write about it are related to what do you propose to do? What is the academic and professional context of the project? What professional experience prepared you to successfully accomplish this project? What significance does the project hold for you and for your discipline? How will you carry out the, propo the proposed research? How feasible is the project? Um, why does it need to be done in Canada? And what research or facilities are um, available in this country? 
uh, if there are any cultural impacts that might affect your work and how will the results be disseminated. So these are the basic things that most people will, um, will need to address in their project statement. In terms of the review criteria, the, the elements that the, the, the reviewers are looking for are basically the following. If the applicant possesses the training, credentials, and active professional standing appropriate for the project, if the project seems feasible and if it's original, if it's well-designed, if it has characteristics of innovation, uh, and if it seems doable within the, the the amount of time that the person proposes to do it. And in here, it's important to notice that you do not need to finish, start, start and finish your project within your the, the time frame of, of your Fulbright. So a Fulbright can be used to start a project and then the project goes beyond the Fulbright. That's perfectly fine. However, when you're proposing, when you're describing your project, you need to basically address the total time frame of the project in, in cases it goes beyond the Fulbright. The project needs to be understood by people that are not experts in your field because the reviewers, the review committee doesn't always have people that are experts in, in, in your field. Your ability to be an ambassador of the US while in Canada, and basically by this we mean to um, portray what's being done in the US in your field of, of, uh, of interest, um, eventually involve Canadian colleagues in activities that are happening in the US during your stay here, so for example, online seminars or conferences, things of that sort. And one very important element are the recommendation letters. You should make, you need to make sure that whoever is your reference can speak highly about your ability to conduct the project that you're proposing, as well as your skills and uh, eventually, if they, they have worked with you in past projects, uh, all the, the, um, the important elements that you bring into the, the project. Now, in terms of the application platform, the application platform is relatively straightforward. And this is just a screenshot of, of what the application looks like. Once you log in, there's a, there's a menu on the left, the one with the, with the, the, blue, the blue words. And then there's a series of, a series of fields that you need to fill out. So when you are applying for a Fulbright, you can apply for a Fulbright in different countries. Um, as a US scholar, you have a lot of opportunities. In this case, we are just focusing on, on Canada. So that's where, where we will focus our attention. So when you are um, preparing your application, you will need to select the country that you can see here. And then you have to select the type of award or the category of the award that you're applying. So in here, you see all the categories that we that we addressed in the slides. So you do not see the individual names of each award, but you see the categories. So I anticipate that you can see this video. So this video basically um, gives you an idea of the application platform and the different things that come up with each uh, section of the menu. So this is the section where you select the country and then you select the award. For some reason in the video, the drop down did not show up, but, uh, but the, the logic is that it's just a drop down where you have to select the country. Then you go into the award details where you are basically describing the discipline of the award, the project title, if there are any ethical requirements, the proposed award duration. In here, it's where you recommend your references. So as we, we noticed, there are two references that need to be submitted. <clears throat> Language skills for you will not be an issue because most, most would be English native speakers. Uploads and essays is where you are going to upload the project statement, your CV, your syllabus, your bi bibliography. So everything that needs to be uploaded will come here. And there are also some questions that you will need to address. The academic and professional information is basic information, usually mostly for statistical purposes and also 
to allow us to identify which areas are receiving the most applications. Personal information, it's self-explanatory. You basically include information about yourself. Um, the contact information is exactly the same thing. So you will include information so that we can contact it, can contact you. So all the contacts are done usually via email or phone. So it's very important that you provide an email that um, that is your primary email. And then the other things are the signature and the review process, which is not part of the video just because it's um, it's just signing and reviewing and making sure that everything is okay. So moving on. So this this completes our our, our presentation. One of the good things is this was just the, the the introduction to what you can expect from from Fulbright in Canada and the opportunities here. Should you have any questions between now and September 15, or even if you are not considering applying this year, but consider applying in the near future, if you have questions, please write to us at info at fulbright.ca and we will be more than happy to assist you with any questions that you have. And on that topic of questions, we can um, open, the, open the presentation for any questions that you may have so you you will have you will so you will have I mean I will provide the the um, this presentation a, a PDF of this presentation afterwards, so you can also revisit it, and if if um, if when doing so you have questions for sure just reach out to us at info at fulbright.ca that email comes directly to me so you can just say that you have um, you have um, uh, listened to the presentation then on for Duke University on, and I already know what, what we are talking about and, and ask any questions that you have at that time. Yeah, so one of the things that I can probably add, well, eventually someone may be writing any questions or, or thinking about questions. Um, our awards, they, they from year to year, they, they may change. However, in terms of the categories, they have been like this for several years now. So it's very um, likely that in, in subsequent editions, if this is not, for example, the year that you're able to apply, um, you will find the same categories. However, some awards may have changed, may have been adjusted. Um, some of them have remained in our catalog for quite some time. However, there are universities that always like to propose new new new. Uh, new awards every year so for example the university of calgary usually does not repeat awards they, they every year they they suggest new awards while other universities they tend to stay with the same awards for um a, a specific number of years and probably they will change them once they sort of reach that that point where they have enough people doing research in that in that field um One, one other thing is that, so in terms of the timeline, so some people also might be wondering about this. The applications run until September 15. Um, after all the, after the deadline, applications are usually reviewed uh, until the end of the year. So around December, early January, there is a pool of candidates that know if they have been recommended for the second stage of the assessment of the, of the process. If by any chance the candidate was not recommended, they will be informed at that time and, and they will be informed that the process for them has finished. If they were recommended, then what happens is their file will go to the institution that they have indicated as being the one that they would like to be considered for. Institution will review the files and will let us know which is the candidate that they would like to welcome there. That that um, that application is also validated by our office, is validated by our colleagues and in Fulbright in the US. And if everything is okay, the person is then um, informed that they have been selected for a Fulbright award. The, um, the results are being announced usually at this time. So late April, early May, it's when people know about the results. 
So you submit your application in September, and then just to make it simpler, in May, you, you know the results. That's usually the, the timeline. <clears throat> Hello, if I may interject, it looks like we do have a question from Catherine Kay, or Key, rather, um, from NCCU. Um, she's asking if you have awards for science education, specifically developing research projects for undergraduates to conduct. So, um, let me just go. I'm a, I'm a research and teaching. So we have some awards in the educational field. Uh, for example, the, the one at Alberta is, is just an award in education in general. So it's very likely that they are open to different uh, projects in, in the field of education. Um, what I would recommend is that if, um, if Catherine can send us an email with the type of project that she's interested, um, I can reply and, and say which are the words that seem to be suitable for that type of project, and also the primary contact at the institutions that are hosting those awards. Like that, she can reach out to them and sort of discuss if that is a project that is of interest to them. Because from our, from our end here, we can only sort of confirm that the project is aligned with the, with the field that is being offered. But when it comes to the specifics, we are not able to confirm it because that is something that it's usually defined at the internal level at the institution. <clears throat> yeah, so when, when, in, when in doubt, and this is always our recommendation, when in doubt if the project might be suitable for a particular award, just write to us. Just write one or two lines about the project or about the field, and we can provide any sort of guidance as to which awards might be useful and the contact information of the, the, the people at the host institution that can eventually then provide you more, more insights as to the suitability of, of your project and what, what they can offer or at least work with. That's wonderful. For any other outstanding questions? <laughs> Did you want any final remarks, Paolo? Um, so I, I, I think the presentation and now these last elements that I provided um, would give a very good um, starting point. Um, when, when applying for, for a Fulbright, um, we, are, we are able to provide guidance on, on different elements of the application. So if, this is also another thing that you can, you can reach out to us. If when navigating the application platform, there are, you are unsure of how to deal with a particular section, um, let us know uh, because we can definitely assist you with, with also that, that part of the, of the process. And, um, and the, the the main thing is always reach out to us when in doubt. That's that's basically it. And um, and this is what I hope that you take from from this presentation is just a sort of a big bird's eye view on the whole thing, the, the awards and the application. But then when it comes to the specifics, do reach out to us because we are here to to help you in any way that we that we can. So. Once again, Amanda and everyone at Duke, thank you so much for, for organizing the, the presentation. This was this was really helpful to be able to, to speak to, to, to scholars at, at different institutions and also to, to have this presentation available afterwards for anyone that wishes to, to revisit it. Thank you. I also saw someone unmuted. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? <laughs> yeah, I, I had a question about uh, the research chair award. Does one need to be the chair of a department? Why is it called a research chair award? No, no. For, uh, so actually, in terms of the research chair award, in most oh. cases, um, so li like I said at the beginning, you do not need to be affiliated with any institution, actually. So you, you, you can definitely be a, a faculty member, or you can be um, an independent researcher, uh, you can be someone that just finished uh, a postdoc uh, 
so it's pretty broad in the in the type of profiles that we are able to okay. to to consider. So definitely, it's not a research chair because you need to be a chair. It's just the name that they they yeah, gave the, the award. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, if there's no other questions, I want to thank you, Paolo, again, for virtually visiting Duke. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate you, you know, making uh, not only Duke, but also some of our local institutions aware of these opportunities. Thank you all for joining us. I know there was mixed representation here, so we're really um, thankful that you all joined us today. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I did put in the chat um, the email that you can direct questions to. Feel free to reach out to me as well. We will be sharing a video with all those who registered. So this video will be shared. It will also be up on our website. Um, and then feel free to, again, reach out to Paolo directly, or you can reach out to us and we can connect you. Um, and then, Paolo, you also mentioned perhaps you could share the PowerPoint, and I could yeah. relay that as well. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So Thank you all again for joining us and have a great afternoon. Take care. Bye.